Uh, go away, drums. Okay. <laughs> I wish getting rid of a drummer were that easy. <laughs> uh, let's see. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, let's see. There's my happy Easter message. <laughs> I know most of you will get that. I did send it to some kids at church this weekend, and they were like, I don't get it. <laughs> so. Let me give some shout outs for, for the moment. Uh, let's see, uh, Becker, good to see you. You're first up. All right. Oh, I got to do the, um, uh, let me grab that Discord link and I'll, I'll uh, pin it. So anyone who wants to, um, anyone who wants to uh, join up on the Discord, let's see. Uh, let's see, Dennis, Holly, uh, let's see, Becker, uh, Aslan, good to see you. I uh, hope you all had a happy Easter. Yes, it was a good day. It was a, it was a long week and um, uh, five services, one on Friday, two on s Saturday, and two on Sunday. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the services still up, up on uh, streaming or not. Uh, they, uh, the church Facebook page may still have the worship service. I know the message is always kept up there, but there's some BMI, ASCAP, maybe issues or something about, like, when you they stream something, you can um, stream, but you can't leave it up there. So you can, if you happen to catch it live, it's fine. Um, I think all of our, um, all the payments that they pay every year cover that. But if you leave it up, then it's I'm, it's maybe more like um, you're releasing a record or something. Or I don't know. It's 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 a different. It, you know, Harry Fox may have to get involved or something. But um, let's see who else is in here. Uh, let's see, uh, John. Hey, what's going on? AJ, Michael, Michael Hutton. Good to see you, Lena. Always good to see you. <laughs> yeah, the, I am committed because man. Oh, it was so hard to get up this morning. I'm telling you, I've been working so hard. And then on top of, so yesterday I had, a because uh, Beth is out of town. And so uh, Alex came over. Alex was uh, um, batching it like myself. And, uh, well, he's always batching it. <laughs> he's a bachelor. Um, but uh, he didn't have anywhere to go for Easter. And so <laughs> it was like, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to make a ham dinner. But Alex is a very good cook. And I said, Hey, why don't you? I'll I'll buy the steaks and uh and everything everything we need for the meal and um why don't you come over and, and help me cook because he's Alex is a really good cook so um, we sous vide some steaks and uh, grilled them and uh and uh, my composer friend bought a ver brought a very good bottle of wine so we had a very nice bottle of wine with the steak it was great and we just had a wonderful time I mean we talked literally nonstop for seven hours uh, it's one of the you know that's just. It's really, we could have been eating macaroni and cheese and it still would have been an exceptional evening. So, um, so yesterday was, you know, a, actually a fairly relaxed day, but um, prior to that Saturday, I had two sessions on top of playing two services at church. So I had a session in the afternoon um, for a game. And then when I got home from church, I had some movie stuff that I had to do for the for the new rock there's a movie coming out starring the rock and I'm working on that and um so I I was I was working you know recording and man and so just not getting enough sleep and I thought well yeah I didn't even set an alarm this morning I said I'm gonna come I'm gonna get on the live stream when I get on the live stream and normally I'll wake up around 6 30 without just like I just get up but it hit like it was 8 10 or something when I woke up I was like oh, okay uh, and I'll tell you, wine gives me a headache. Uh, I like the feeling of wine. Yeah, the 200th lesson, I know it's crazy. It's over 200 if you count the other live streams that I've done prior to this. But yeah, since COVID, it's been 197 lessons. So that means next Monday will be 200, I think. 
assuming I do Wednesday and and Wednesday's going to be weird because I like I said I have to pick up Beth at the airport so I don't know what it may be a real short lesson on Wednesday uh, and that <laughs> you like our <laughs> the Easter egg hair everybody's like I don't get it hey Jack Lloyd Austin Texas never been want to go. You could, you could fill a map with the places I've never been. <laughs> you could fill a library with stuff I don't know. <laughs> Alien Easter, yeah. <laughs> Pretty funny, huh? It's like Easter Bunny was looking for eggs and he found one. Uh, anyway, pretty stupid. All right. Goodbye, Easter guy. Okay. So, um, in the, uh, let's see, who else is on here? So we're going to work on just play, playing 16th notes. We're going to just try to, I, I didn't have time to really kind of come up with a, a specific, I mean, I could riff, and by riff, I mean riff like a comedian riff for hours. You know that. Um, but we're, we're going to, uh, again, um, uh, we're going to take our cues from drummers. And um, so on that groove that I was just playing it with, I can change the hi hat, so I'm gonna I'm gonna mute the kick and snare, and hopefully you can hear this hi hat. I could turn it up, I think. Let me turn it up some more. Oh no, I didn't. Okay, there it is. Okay, so I've got on this particular patch, I have four different ones. Oh wait, yeah, we dropped down to 85. So let me put it back at 100. Oh, no, you know what? 85 is good for 16th notes. What was I thinking? Let's say 85. So I'm at 85 BPM, which means beats per minute. That's shorthand, unless you go and explain what BPM means, and then it no longer becomes shorthand. Um, so this chord is one, two, three, four. Okay. And then the next setting, eighth notes. But the two, it's... It's like an eighth note with a soft, the and, it's hard soft, hard soft, hard soft, like that. So it's one, two, and three, and four, and accenting the downbeats, which are one, two, three, and four. Okay? So if the drummer's doing that, you know, you might be... Play that kind of beat. Or, okay? Now if he swung, I could swing it. Hear the swing, and I set the swing on that at 60. I'll set 60 percent swing. So it's good to practice those kind of feels too. I mean, it's almost impossible to play by yourself eighth notes without swinging a little bit. So there's back to straight eights. Okay, now I'm going to click the next option here for the hi hat. Okay, so it's still eighth notes, but he opens it up every one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three. It's kind of random. And I think if I, it changes if I move the X, Y thing around. But we're still at eighth notes. So if the drummer's doing that, you're still probably going to want to play eighth note feel. If I move this. Yeah, it's a little more complex. I move it down here, it becomes simpler, softer. Yeah. I'm gonna kind of leave it right around here. Okay, now if I go to the last one, this is where we get the 16th note feel. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a see if you can see if you can tap that out. But what I want you to do um, is to practice when you listen to music in your car, in, you know, at home, on when music's playing on the TV. If it's contemporary music of some kind, as long as it's not orchestral, there's going to be probably a drummer. Uh, now, if it's hip hop, you're going to have trap hats, and those are going to be insane. <laughs> Uh, this would be like, <laughs> you know, it's like, so, so probably not hip hop, but 
anything with the real drums, see if you can start to like what what's real real important as you become a, a more proficient musician is the ability to to take what you're hearing and separate it into parts and go oh I hear the bass now that helps you figure out the chords. You have a shot at knowing, okay, well then, if we're in G, that helps you figure out the chord. Okay, and if you, you can pick out the guitar, you know, the guitar might not be doing this. The guitar might be going something like... You can start to pick out those individual things. And the hi-hat will tell you, you can hear the hi-hat, you'll be able to hear the kick. So I'm gonna add the kick in. And the kick is also instructive, will tell you maybe where to put accents or where to put the bass note. And a lot of times, um, so I tell, you know, guitar players, so guitar players, you play along with uh, generally the drummer's right hand, the hi-hat. Now, now, when a 16th note pattern like that is going on, the drummer's probably using both hands. I mean, I know drummers can play a, a 16th figure with one hand, but what you're hearing there is two sticks. You hear the accents. It's very human sounding, I mean, even though it's a machine, uh, but it's a sample of a drummer. Um, the bass player, okay, so the, the the guitar player should lock to the drummer's right hand, or if he's a left-handed drummer, which is pretty rare to have a, I know left-handed drummers that play right-handed drum kits too, but the hi-hat is what you want to lock to. The bass player wants to lock to the drummer's right foot. So we lock to the drummer's right hand, and the bass player should lock to the drummer's right foot, generally. And the kick is what the bass player would lock to. So check this out. I'm going to mute the hi-hat now. I'll put the click in. Now, you don't have to play every note, or you can still fill in there. You might, bass players can, can be as busy or as simple as they want to be, whatever's best for the song, of course. Uh, but that's a, the kick drum is a good starting point. And usually, in every band I've ever been in, the bass player and the drummer have either played together a lot. I call them the battery of the band. The battery in baseball is the pitcher and the catcher. I kind of feel like the the, uh, the bass player and the, the drummer are kind of the battery of, of uh, any band. <laughs> and um, usually you'll see, even if, if they've never worked together before or, you know, they they will still discuss, or if you're writing a song together, if you're in a band, the bass player and the drummer uh, will often go, well, what are you going to do? You know, what, what's the, you know, what are you going to, what do you think we should do here uh, rhythmic-wise? Or the drummer's really being um, uh, very proactive about the drum part, then the bass player will probably match that. And same thing, if the bass player's got an idea, then the drummer will probably match him. So, you know, it's it's interesting though because the drummer, you know, is kind of like the heart of the band. And uh, again, the gu guitar player should listen to the hi hat, and the drummer should listen to. I mean, the bass player should listen to the kick drum. And of course, it all comes together. Um, but if it's if it stems off from the drummer, then you know you're going to be fairly. You're going to have a fairly uh, cohesive and tight rhythm section. If if you're, um, you know, and then the the other thing is the. Um, uh, I say, and then the guitar player gets their harmony from the piano player's right hand, and the bass player gets their their harmony from the piano player's left hand. Assuming there's a four piece band, guitar, bass, drums, keys, right? So, 
Everybody's on spring break. Um, uh, using up and down motions. Uh, upstroke can, can, but it doesn't have to. It's up, it's, depends on how full you want your upstroke to sound. John is asking a question. Uh, when strumming using up and down. So I'm hitting all six strings. But I could. If I do that, if I do like three strings, the bottom three strings on the downstroke and top three strings on the upstroke, it kind of sounds a little oompa, right? Oompa, oompa, oompa. Almost, you know, if I went. So we probably don't want that sound. Yeah, so you can hit, if, you know, if you want a really full sound. Now keep in mind, it's really easy to get a full sound on an E chord. But if we're playing D, you know, I'm bringing my thumb around to kill that A and, and E string because I want to have that full feel. I don't want to, I don't want to choke my wrist, you know, and, and do a really short stroke because I'm afraid of hitting the bottom two strings. I'd much rather mute them uh, than change my right hand um, uh, uh, you know, uh, ergonomics or methodology uh, to accommodate a smaller chord, if that makes sense. Oh, it's that too. Oops. smaller you got a smaller uh, target so you've got to be real you know you got to be a little bit more port pinpoint with a big E chord or a G chord you can kind of just bang out the whole guitar C chord I'll often bring my thumb around now if I were to take that and slow that down yeah, I, I mean, I'm kind of aiming for the, the bottom strings and the top, the, the low strings and the high strings, but I'm pretty much hitting them all to keep a full sound. But I could, you know, if I only went like bottom three, top three, at a faster tempo, you might not notice uh, the oompa thing as much as you would in, say, if you were doing a slow eighth note. That said, what's this? Uh, that kind of gives you a. a uh, two, um, that's it. Was it? No, was it? Uh, what's that? Us by the Beatles. Oh, thank you, Lena. Um, and then I, I saw, uh, uh, shoot, where is he? Is he on today? Uh, he requests my PayPal. So my PayPal is up on the, uh, if you want to go direct that way too, uh, that is up on the uh, uh, Discord page. So. so, hey, you're alive, Gary. I can't believe it. Oh, Catherine had an issue. See, baby-sized hands aren't. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. So you are going to have to moderate. Now, it's, uh, some players that um, actually can't do that thumb. They will often, you know, like play bar chords, which is funny. But I, I, you know, like. Often uh, do that because they can, you can you, you can kill more strings and shorten strokes better than you can, but yeah and so you just do all your songs in the key of E. <laughs> um, one little trick you can do too is is if you wanted to be able to play an A and a B chord uh, in the key of E without um, having to mute strings, 
um, you can play, so play E like this. So instead of using these three fingers, use these three fingers, okay? So it feels a little awkward, but it's like you're making an F bar chord and then you just bring it down. Okay, and then just go up to the, to the sixth fret, but put your first finger on the fifth fret, but you don't need a bar. Let the top strings ring out. And that's technically an A2 chord, but you can keep banging all six strings on the right hand. And if you slide it up two more, you get a B4 chord before and after chord, okay? So what we have is a B chord with another B and then an E at the same time. Now, because we're in the key of E, that actually, that E note actually sounds predictive, okay? So if I go... That's a little trick if you're in the key of E and you don't want to have to like make this B bar chord. Um, but I will often do uh, that as well. Like I'll do an E power chord. So I'm going zero, um, seven, nine, nine, zero, zero. And then it's a matter of just not hitting the low E string. I bring my thumb around obviously because it's easy for me. Um, but uh, if I just move this shape down to the fourth fret, so I'm, I'm playing just a power chord basically, leaving the top two strings open, that's a C sharp minor seven chord. And then this is a, a B sus chord, there's no third in there. And then this would be an A two chord, there's no third in there either. And then we go back to E. And there's no third in here, this is E five, so it's E, E, B, E, B, E. In fact, these, these were even redundant notes. What I'm doing is I'm actually muting the sixth string with my first finger. So here, so I'm taking, I'm kind of playing, instead of playing right on the tip of my first finger, I'm gonna play it right here, just for, give me a second here. I'm actually using more of the meat of the finger. And I'm playing it right now just to, to put a dent in my finger so you can see it. So you might be able to see that. Let's see. Uh, you said dent in my finger there. I don't know if you can see that, but um, that's that's because I'm I'm playing more down here and less up here. Normally I might play on a tip, but if I want to, I don't lay down the finger too much because then you're going to mute the top strings. But you can totally use your the tip of your first finger to mute the bottom string. Do it all the time. And that cleans up your sound because if I didn't do that and I let that E string ring out or tried to miss it and hit it occasionally, um, you're going to really lose the, the focus of these chords. It's going to sound less like a C sharp minor seven chord. It's going to sound less like a B chord. It's going to sound less like an A chord. So check it out. I'll do it. So you're definitely going to want to try to mute that bottom string. On the E chord, of course, you can play the E string, but, but when you get down to C sharp, like, another thing you can do too, which is cool, you go to the third fret and makes a C major seven. Well, that's a great chord right there. Now it's technically, there's, oh, there is a third in there, sorry. It's totally a pure C major seven. So we have C, G, C, B, and E. And the notes in a C major seven would be C, E, G, B. So it'd be in order, um, color my world. Just watch the, the Terry Kath experience again with Alex. He'd never seen it. It was pretty fun. Fun, you know. Uh. Yeah, it's a that's a great chord. It just sounds like the seventy. You could actually even just take your first finger off, and that's a great chord, too. This is one of the ones I did in the, the digging deeper into e, A minor. I just did a um, a new video. Well, I haven't posted it yet, and I'm still working on it because it's taking. I've got it's a lot of diagrams. We'll see how popular it is, but 
I just did a video, uh, some fun chords in open C tuning, which is not like open D drop down a whole step. It's a, uh, it's a little different than that. Um, so I had to go on a, I had to be like the investigative journalist and go after and try to find as many chords as I could find. So I got a, so a bunch of good ones, I think. Um, hopefully, hopefully it'll be a popular video. Uh, it, it, it was, it's, I think going to be around 20 minutes long. It's quite a long video. And thus, that's what's taking me so long is I've got to do all those uh, diagrams. I like to have that with all that information on there, you know, the, the, the notes and the, uh, the, um, the values of the notes and things like that. So Brian Harkins, how you doing? Uh, Joe, uh, Joseph Galasso, good to see you. Yeah. Three quarter size guitar. I think my first guitar was either seven eighths or three quarters. I can't remember my very first one. I was nine years old. Uh, my first. So then I got the 12 string, which, like I said, almost made me want to quit guitar because it was a K 12 string. It was a very cheap 12 string. And I loved John Denver when I was, you know, 11 years old. But man, you know, that 12 strings are hard to play and a cheap one's even harder. And the neck going from like, a, I think, a 7 8 guitar to a. Uh, basically a dreadnought that thing i don't know if i even have any pictures of me with it but it it was you know it was like reaching over it was pretty funny i would love to have like a big a super sized guitar that could remind me what it's like to be a you know a 10 year old kid playing guitar um but i uh, uh my first my next guitar when i was 13 and it's the only one i of those that i still have um, was a um, an Ibanez 175 copy, a Gibson 175 copy by Ibanez. Um, in fact, it was a lawsuit model. I got it in, would have been, I think it's a 73. I got it in 74, I think. Maybe it was a 74. Um, I got it for my birthday when I turned 13. And um, that, those guitars have, the, the 175s have a very skinny, particularly that one has a very skinny neck. Um, so, and I don't think I got, well, I got a Strat, I had a Strat-like guitar, a GNL, um, like Strat-like guitar, but in a, my next guitar after that was a Les Paul, which I think the neck was a little wider than the, but at my recollection, and I don't have it out right now, but is that the, the fret, the, the, the neck was pretty narrow there. So it was pretty easy to play for a kid. Um, and I, that's really, that guitar is where I, I probably, the time I had that guitar and the Les Paul, were probably the times that I uh, I, I grew the most as a, as a guitar player because I was learning so much and, and just try well in the college I got the classical guitar which is wider neck also um, so yeah it's uh, the when I look back at the width of the guitars I've had you know early on in my learning process um, it's funny because the the 175 was probably about the same width as that 7 8 guitar which was a seven eight classical guitar. So a seven eight classical guitar is going to have a, still going to have a fairly wide neck. Um, and somebody was asking me about that. That was one of the questions about is would it be okay for a kid to learn uh, ukulele? Oh yeah, there are a lot of great guitar players that started on ukulele. Alex did, uh, George Benson did, and um, so I it's guitar is far more th uh, about the physical thing. You can especially a young person gets it like that. Uh, the mental aspect of it, the memorizing chord shapes and, and learning scales and memorizing notes on a fretboard, that stuff comes slower. Um, so you can get a little bit of a head start on a ukulele, uh, just starting to learn shapes and things like that. So I don't really have a problem with a little kid learning how to play ukulele to get them into it. And the other thing that happens on ukulele that's almost identical to the guitar is your, your right hand, you learn to play grooves and everything. And that's an eighth note is an eighth note, no matter what in instrument it's played on. So you start to learn about eighth notes and 16th notes and things like that. So now um, on this uh, here, down, oops, down here, the 16th note, you'll notice that I didn't put up and down markings. Um, I don't want to make, I don't want to make the assumption that it is all up and down. Okay. Uh, because speed metal and stuff like that could be all downstrokes. Um, and I know that's what Dennis wants to play. <laughs> I mentioned Dennis and his name pops up. Oh, Sam's here. Hey, Sam, how's the hip? Are you getting out of the house yet, Sam? Sam had a uh, hip replacement. A hip replaced. 
Am I hip? <laughs> So, but one of the keys to playing the, the, the 16th notes, the fast 16th notes, is to keep, again, to keep your wrist pretty loose. Don't tighten up and don't, don't grab the pick tight. That's also bad. Again, you're going to hold the pick loose uh, and you're going to keep your wrist loose. And uh, you may, picks may go flying across the room. Okay, that's okay. Um, I had that happen yesterday, in fact, and I had to finish it like this. So I'm basically going up with my thumb and down with my fingers. It's a very flamenco thing to do. But I'm doing it all really more with my wrist and not with my, I'm not flicking. I'm just kind of turning my wrist and dragging my thumb and then turning my wrist again and dragging my fingers over the strings. I may be throwing my fingers a little bit. We can learn that pattern. I will show you that one if you really want to learn the rumba. Uh, and I'm not very good at it, but I know the mechanics of it. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I, I basically just bought the Gypsy King's greatest hits and, and tried to learn all of their grooves. Like I just went song by song and going, oh, you know. Um, and it's kick, kick, snare. fun groove actually when you get it down there was a point where I was using it in a movie and I kind of practiced for just just a few minutes maybe 15 minutes my arm was so tired my oh, up here I was just like oh man I'm just so tired and uh but I got it down pretty good that where I could I could get I only needed to play it for like oh it was like 40 seconds of this one section of the song and uh um I, I he actually sounded really really good. I was like, oh man, that sounds. Good. I mean, I used my flamenco guitar uh, for that, and it, it just was like, oh my gosh. But it kind of it's 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 not the typical pick and hand strumming technique. So you know, it's not, it's some guys can do that. They can just oh, you know they're right there, and then they pick up the pick and they go again. A lot of the guys that do the rubber stuff, they can't use a pick. Like they they don't. It just doesn't work for them. But the key, really really important, is to hold it loosely, and if. If you're having trouble with that, then then get a thin pick. Um, like you could get one of these Dunlop, like this is a Dun, Dunlop nylon set 0.73. And for me, that's super thin. And at least that one, it's less likely to, to hook on the strings like a fish hook, right? Um, but at the same time that you are should be holding the pick fairly loosely. And, I, I, and if I'm using a really thin pick, because this is 7.73, this is 1.5. So this one's literally twice as thick as this and hard as a rock. Um, you, you, do, you don't necessarily, you can hold it a little tighter if you want because the pick is going to do most of the flexing. You don't need to, but um, you're still going to want to, you're still going to want to relax your wrist. And if you, if you can kind of see in slow motion, I think probably when I'm going down, my pick is probably at a you know a 45 degree angle this way, and when I'm coming up, the pick's probably at a 45 degree angle this way. See, if it was the opposite, if you're doing a 45 angle, <laughs> it would be snag. You're gonna be, you're gonna break strings. You're not gonna be able to do it. So that's why the wrist has to be loose so that you can get that. Okay. Now let's say you have this down. We can stick with the E chord because it's nice and big, and and you don't have to mute any strings. Um, let's say you get that. Okay, I'm going to go back to the hi hat here. I'm going to not put the snare in, just the kick and the hi hat. And so I'm, I hear the drummer playing hi hat, 16th notes, and therefore I'm assuming that I'm going to need to kind of that feel. If I'm playing acoustic, for example. Now, what I want to try to do is I'm going to try to accent where the kicks are. And, and, one, two, and, three, and, four, one, two, and, and, just maybe get the one, and, boom, boom. In fact, if I, if I maybe put it a little bit simpler, there we go, oh, no, that's, I don't like that. 
All right, we'll leave it there. So, boom. So if I accent those, what I'm doing? I get boom, boom, get that eight, the and of three as well. Here's what that sounds like. I'm going to accent one. I'm going to accent the and of two and the and of three. Two, three. Four. And that's a feel right there. That right there is its own feel. back and forth between E and E suspended so that you try to you're you're able to kind of keep track of where one is because you change on one and that way you don't lose a track of oh wait a minute is it one two or three four where am I up there we got 39 people awesome all right so let me let me change the groove and see what the well oh no let's add the, the snare in there um and i could now again can you hear the hi-hat listen to the hi-hat i don't know how good the quality is going through i apologize i should upgrade my system so that i'm like, but then I'd have to talk into a microphone because I'd be going through logic. So that, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do it. Okay, you hear the hi-hat, right? You hear the kick? Every other time it goes on the and of four as well. Okay. Um, and you hear the snare. The snare is real simple on this pattern. Two and four. One, two, three, four. That's the drummer's left hand, generally. Holly's doing yeoman's work there. Oh, that's right. Because, because, uh, uh, that's right. I forgot. He's, uh, he's not here this week. Bruce isn't here. He's visiting family. I think he's back Wednesday. Okay. So, that's, um... Uh, hold on a second. Let me see if I can answer John's question. All right. Uh, John asks, is the bass drum on the ends of B2? Yes, and three. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So I'm going to change. So again, I'm going to play that groove again, but I'm going to isolate. Here's the hi-hat. This is the 16th note feel. Hear that? I'm going to get rid of the click. Okay. Here's the snare. Oh, interesting. That's a flam, isn't it? I think there's two. Oh, wait. I can't look close, but yeah. It sounds like two snare hits. It's kind of a flam. Okay, now here's the kick by itself. Two. Without the click, it's almost hard to tell where the drum is. The kick. Two, three, four. One, two. Yep, on those are the ands of three and. And. One, two. And. And. And one, two. And. And. Okay. So, all together it makes this. Okay. Okay, now I'm going to do it. I'm going to choose. I've got several different patterns I can do here. I'm going to change change up this one. Okay, again, here's the hi hat, which ha doesn't change because I, when I changed it, it only changed the kick and snare pattern. Okay. Um, in fact, if I go back to here's the kick and snare. Two, three, four. 
here's the, what we did before, I think. No, here's what we did before. Okay. So when I move this cursor over, it's going to change the kick and snare pattern. Okay, and throw that hi-hat back in. So if I were to emulate that maybe on a... Um, I might go in. Um, so the, um, that, so it's, it's, it's really cool to listen. And so that's all with just one of these. I, let me totally do a different feel here. This one's called mixtape. Okay. And I'm going to put it kind of in the middle here. So it's not too complex. Let's listen to this one. Uh, oh, you get no fills. I'm going to turn off the fills. Okay. I'm going to give you the kick. Here's the kick. Oops. Two, three, and four, and one, two, three, and four, and one, two, three, and so the that might be where the I, I might put the accents here. The kick, the snare is going to be pretty much two and four, I think. So now I'm doing that. Okay, now what's the hi-hat doing? Okay, now hi-hat is doing an eighth note feel. Kind of a thing, hard, soft, hard, soft, hard, soft, right? Hitting harder on the one, two, three, four, and softer on the end. But I'm going to click this up to the six. There's a, we're back to our, back to our 16th note feel. Sorry. But I'm going to put the kick back in there and the snare. I'm going to put the kick in first. So we're, so our right hand is just doing pure eighth notes. I mean, sixteenth notes. Um, but we're putting accents in different places. And what that does is it creates a new groove. That's a new groove. We did this one. This one is, it's a subtle difference, okay, but it's, we're learning, we're, we're, we're creating a groove by trying to emulate what the drummer's doing. We're kind of, in this case, I'm kind of combining what the, uh, the hi-hat and the kick are doing to get my, oh, okay, hi-hat's playing 16th notes, okay, I'm going to play 16th notes. We're, the BPM on this is 85. Um, and again, BPM is shorthand for beats per minute, unless you take the time to explain that BPM is shorthand for beats per minute, and then it's no longer shorthand because you're explaining. Okay. <laughs> it's the, those that know me are laughing right now at me or near me, not with me. Um, so, uh, <laughs> the um, uh, so I'm I'm kind of I'm I'm listening to the hi hat to get the, the the pace of the right hand. I'm listening to the kick to get the accents. Hey, Sham.
Yeah, and this is a uh, this is the nylon, not the Tortex. Um, I, this, the Tortex, the ones I use are blue, purple, and light purple, and they're one point five millimeters. This is the, I use this pick for twenty years. This is my main pick. Yeah, I like the Tortex. I like the sound of. Actually, it's funny. You remember I, I've changed over to the uh, to these guys here, these um, gravity picks, slightly because they're a little larger, and also because they have. And I get the unpolished edge, so they have a little bit of more of a, a abrasive sound. So I can hear more of the pick attack in the in the playing. Not quite as bad as the U2 pick, you know, the, the edge uses. Not that scrapey, but kind of halfway in between that. But lately, I've been going back to this pick because I don't want to hear that sound. I want a more pure, rounder tone. If I, if I stop in the middle of it, I'm never going to finish. That's Donna Lee by Charlie Parker. Anyway, okay. Um, so, but here's, now, here's what I'm going to do. Let's see if I can do this. I don't, I don't know. I'm going to try this. Um, I'm going to try to add a snare hit. Um, so I'm going to emulate the hi-hat with the pace of the right hand. I'm going to emulate the kick drum with uh, the accents, okay? And again, here, let me play that groove. Okay, so and then I'm gonna emulate the snare, which I think is just two and four, hopefully. Okay, so snare is just simple two and four. I'm gonna emulate that with a snare hit, what I call a snare hit. Windows over here. And what I'm doing is I'm I'm muting over here, but I don't have to. I'm actually muting with the side of my hand, so I'm kind of making contact with the strings with the side of my hand and the pick at the same time. Okay. In some ways, it is a snare hit, and if I were playing by myself, you would hear it as such. But this is going to be a lot quieter than this. So in some ways, I'm actually creating a 16th note gap in my strumming pattern to make the snare drum, the drummer's snare, come and pop out more in the mix. It's like uh, the perfect example. Let me stop the drums. Sorry. The perfect example is watch. Uh, dang it. Um, <laughs> I can't think of his name. Okay, I'm gonna look it up. I'm not even gonna say who I'm thinking about because you'll all be yelling it. I don't want you all to be like typing the name, his name. Um, I should know this. Oh yeah, okay. So, vision envision Charlie Watts playing drums. Most drummers, when they play an eighth note pattern, they go bum 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 bum. So when they hit the snare hit, they hit the hi hat at the same time, right? I played slow motion. One and two and or sorry, one and two and one, you know, like that. So their their hands are going down together. Charlie Watts does this. One and watch him. He doesn't hit the hi hat on four, two and four. Uh, he lets that be just the domain of the snare. Uh, when I'm programming drums. Almost always, um, I, I always leave the hi-hat on two and four, but I, I never put a kick on two and four because it's just like, it takes away from the kick and it takes away from the hi-hat or the snare, and I kind of want them to, to both be uh, featured or have their space. Um, so I'm going to try to do a, uh, let's see, uh, I'm going to let this drummer inspire me. What's the drummer's name? I forget. Kyle. It sounds like Kyle. This is Kyle. So I got my 16th notes. Okay. Accent. Not really. Let me 
turn off drums so you can hear that pattern. So, so this drummer just inspired me to create this new pattern. Ah, what am I doing? What was it? Sorry. Bump. Oh, that's why. Okay. So it's one on the kick is one, three, and so it's. Yeah, so it is. So if that were the drums on a song that I'm playing in a club by myself, that might be the pattern. If I were, you know, accompanying a singer or I was accompanying myself, that might be the pattern I would use. I just stole it uh, instrument by instrument from the drum set. And that, <laughs> I literally in logic here with drummer, I have probably over a billion different drum patterns, literally a billion different drum patterns. Uh, because every pattern has an X, Y thing on it, and I can add fills, I can swing it. I, it's it's really probably even infinite. Um, but like now, I can make it a really busy drummer. Here's a I turn the fills all the way up, same pattern, same tempo. Here's the with the fills all the way up. Instead of hi hat, the drummer may keep the time on the toms like that. Now that's an eighth note. That's a more rock sound. It's not a sixteenth note version of of the tom thing. Now I'm going to turn the fills back down. Okay. And again, you could pull up uh, a drummer looping on um, on YouTube. You could pull up your favorite song. Oh, I keep doing the wrong window. Sorry. You can pull up your favorite song. Um, you could uh, and just try to emulate the drums, but it, not even not even try to imitate them as much as just listen to them and see if you can hear the different elements. Um, it's really good because the same thing is going to be necessary when you're trying to pick out the guitar part. Like if you're in a band and you got two guitar players, well, you you're going to play one guitar part and the other guitar player is going to play a different guitar part. So you're going to have to. Um, decide who's playing which part or whatever. A lot of songs have two guitar parts. A lot of songs have five guitar parts. You just never know. Uh, if you're going to do Bohemian Rhapsody, that's really hard to do with one guitar player, but that's what Queen does. Uh, but the solo has three guitars on it, I think. So, all right. Um, oh, for who? Oh, for you? Is it your birthday? Let's see. Let's see. Uh, There you go, happy birthday. Oh, for Jan, oh, okay. Walter when you need him. Exactly. <laughs> Walter. All right. No, that's fine. He would have too many opinions. I wouldn't be able to keep up with him. <laughs> I forgot he was showing up at those early, some of those early ones. Remember that? All right. So, So yeah, the 16th note thing can really be a useful, a useful pattern. Let me pull up a different groove completely. Okay, so that well, that was mixed type. 
Uh, here's one called uh, Crash the Party. Let's see what this sounds like. Again, I'm going to get rid of the fills. I'm going to make it a little simpler. Oh, this one is, starts out on Tom's. Okay, but I could pull up a completely different drummer. So this is Logan. He's a retro rock guy. He, he has a different drum kit and a different... His snare is much lower. And of course, the tempo is probably should be a lot faster. You know, like one, ten. Right away, when I hear his playing, I think more rock. Uh, and right away, I hear his playing, and I gravitate towards power chords, right? Did you notice that? Um, and so that's kind of a di different, um, totally different feel. All right, let's see. What am I doing? Oh, there we go. Okay. All right, tuning. Um, oh, you know what I need to do? Is I need to check and see if the last couple. Um, if you've got some questions, you can ask some questions here. The last couple. Um, ooh, oh, you've been. Oh, you're using the big stubby three millimeters. Wow. Yes, I agree. I thin picks sound really twangy to me. Uh, there's some really good rock players that use thin picks. I don't know how they do it to be honest. One thing I have noticed, like with a thin pick, if you choke down on it, you know you're you're. It's a it's becomes harder, you know, it becomes more stiff because it can't move anywhere. And if you hold the very end of it like that, then it's very loose. So I will I will do that with um see these Dunlop nylons are 1.0s. These are my main like acoustic strummer sometimes. Although I'm I'm digging strumming with the heavy pick. Um and on this this is the this is like your big stubby. This is my Wigan uh gypsy jazz pick, and I love I was using this for the bluegrass stuff. Because I just love how round the sound is. So um, let me, but I'm going to go to uh, my uh, YouTube channel real quick and, and get rid of all the ads on the live stream stuff. I apologize if you watch the live stream later and then you're like, oh my gosh, what's with all the ads? YouTube does that. I mean, YouTube does that. Oh, wait, that was weird. Oh, I lost subscribers. I had 92,020 and it, down to 14. So they must be going through. Um, they must be going through some get rid of empty, you know, like non, um, uh, you know, dead accounts or whatever. Oh, no. Okay. So it didn't, it, fortunately this, it didn't put them in the mid. So I'm, I, I, I do put mid roll ads. But I only do it like every 30 minutes. So I figure, you know, you can watch an ad every 30 minutes. Um, and so like there, just put two ads in that one. Um, get rid of that. But when YouTube does it, they literally put it in every five minutes. Let's see if they did it here. Nope. Good. Okay. That's awesome. So I'm going to, again, I'm going to, you know, the ads pay a little bit of the bills. So this one, has, I'll probably put three in here because it's a two hour live stream um, and then last week so I saved that and then I closed that and now uh, yes what was uh, what's it so Fridays oh well, this me oh this is <laughs> this is the one we're on now <laughs> I'm like why can't I edit it <laughs> it's because it's me right now <laughs> I'm an idiot okay <laughs> Lego, um, yeah, and, and and it's fine. You can totally use your fingers. People say, "Can I strum? Do I need to use a pick?" Not necessarily. I mean, if there's a certain sound you're going for, 
um, and you're going, I really like the way this guitar player sounds and he uses a pick. Well, you're probably going to have to use a pick. Um, and I say he, she, or she sounds. Uh, classical gas. You know, I haven't, um, I, don't, I, I haven't played classical gas since I was 14. <laughs> so I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do it. And I really can't play because if, if I played it too good, I would not be able to monetize this. They would take all my money. So uh, I, I, I did... Remember when we first started this, I played uh, some uh, Louis Milan, uh, Six Pavanas and a Fantasia. I was talking about, oh, this is really good wedding music and it's fairly easy to play if you know how to read, you know. Um, and I started playing it and I got a copyright strike. And I'm like, how am I getting a copyright strike on playing live music that was written 500 years ago? And the copyright holder was some florist shop in <laughs> and all what they had done is they'd uploaded a video with that music in it, not me playing it, but somebody else playing it. And, um, so YouTube for some reason assumed that they owned the music. And so that was kind of, uh, that was kind of a drag, but no, no, the Fender heavies I used Fender heavies was my Fender medium was my first pick as a kid. Uh, and then I graduated to heavies and then I got into the Dunlop, but, uh, yeah. And it, you know, when you're strumming, as long as you kind of have a loose grip on it, um, you may, it may go flying across the room every now and then, but that it'll, it'll have the same qualities as a thin pick, which, like I said, it's easier to strum with a thinner pick because you're not going to hook the strings. You're not going to like fish hook the strings and break a string or get your hand caught in the strings or whatever. Um, because the, str the pick is kind of giving what, you know, giving, uh, but your wrist can provide that same give. And the fact that you're loose, holding it loosely, because I will I will use the same pick for strumming, even for funk. If I'm doing funk, uh, 16th note stuff on funk, you know, I'm holding my pick very loose. Uh, but if I go to solo, go to single note stuff, then I'll choke down on the pick and I'll hold it a lot tighter. So it'll just change in my hands depending on what I'm doing, whether I'm playing rhythm or lead. Um, I don't have to change picks for that. Sometimes I do. I like to. I use, you know, I typically will have, it, like at church when I'm playing electric, I'll have these three picks up on, on stage. So sometimes I, you know, most of the time I'm using this pick. If I'm going to play like a blue solo or something like that, I'll use this pick. Somebody just rang my doorbell. And then um, this pick, if I want a rounder tone, like I said, so... Um, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, I need to, pff, thanks for reminding me, Sam. I need to throw some nail hardener on my fingernails because they're actually growing out right now and I really would hate to, to break them. I'm, I, I, I've got to file them down a little bit. Oh. <laughs> so, um, I need to file them down a bit just so I don't snag them on something or I need to make sure I don't have any burrs or the catchers on things. So Dennis, what's going on, Dennis? Uh, what's the play playability difference between a thicker and thin frets? Uh, you know, I don't really know. Um, I do like the thicker frets. I really, this thing I've never had refretted. I don't know what the frets are made of. I play on this thing all the time. And maybe because I don't play it live. I mean, the frets are starting to get a little pitted out, but I tell you, my strat, I go through frets so fast on that on my main strat because I'm playing it live. I think I na I think it's natural to play a lot, digging a lot harder when you're playing live. So, um, okay, let me, um, I'm going to throw up a drum groove. I'm going to see, I think I got a package at the door. I hate to leave packages at the door. Let me throw up a drum groove. I'm, I've got, okay, we got Logan on drums. Okay, uh, you got AM Gold, B-Side, Double Live, Firebird. What is Firebird? Oh, it's going to be cymbals. So, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to not make this so crazy like that. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to go check the, check the uh, mail here in a second. And then um, I'm going to play this groove. I want you to try to pick out the kick, the snare, and the hi-hat. Okay. And see what they're doing. All right. I'll be right back.
here's the hi hat. One and two and three. Tempo is faster. One ten. One and two and three and four. So it's playing eighth notes basically with a little bit of. Hear that little. Tss, that's when they're opening up the hi hat. The left foot is on the hi hat pedal, and so if they hold down on it, it sounds like that. And if they it sounds like that, and that's if they let their foot up, it opens up the hi hat and makes that washy sound, and then they they'll close it right away usually. Okay. I think if I put it here, it might go to. That sound is the sound of the pedal open, kind of mostly open. So that'll, they get, that's like for a heavier rock sound. They'll open a hi-hat more like that. But this one's like that. Okay, let's listen to this, uh, let's kick. Let's get, the click is here. One, one two, three, four, one. Wow. One, two, and, and, two. One, and, 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 one, two, and, and. A lot of ands. And, 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 one, two, and, four, and, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So that's crazy, right? A lot of upbeats on the kick. Snare's going to be pretty much two and four. Here it is. Give it the flam. Which, to be honest, is impossible with that snare hi-hat pattern, which is hilarious. A drummer would listen to this and go, it's not playable, because he's flamming on the snare, which means hitting two, two sticks at the same time, or slightly off each other. But he's also got a hi-hat on on all four, on, on those two and fours. That's not possible. You can't have a stick in, one stick in two places at the same time. Okay, here's all together. Okay, so what would I play over that? Well, I love that kick. I'm gonna do like a rock thing. I'm gonna do like a. jamming or whatever and he starts playing that pattern I might or maybe It's just a random pattern that I dropped into to Logic. So, um, and I think GarageBand, if you have a Mac computer, GarageBand, which comes free with a Mac, has um, uh, all of that kind of all of that kind of uh, many, 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 many of those drum patterns, many patterns. Um, okay, so let's see. Sorry, I, I stepped away. I did have. I was wearing pants. Thank you. Yeah, everybody took a sip. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a sippable offense, Gary. Right. Leaving the room. Anyone who tuned tuned in at that moment is like, <laughs> they're not they're not maligning me. If they you know if they if they tune in and they see this, they're not maligning me. <laughs> they're like, why are twenty nine people watching an empty room? They're maligning you. They're like, what's wrong with those people? Why are so many people watching an empty room? What's going to happen? It's very thrilling, actually. It's very exciting. Okay, um, <laughs> oh, Honky Tonk Woman, on, on, on that groove, yep, pants, nice t-shirt, yeah, I hear I play a Martin and a G&L, I have a lot of fenders though, so. 
Corona, California. I've been to Corona. Now, have any of you been to any um, uh, guitar factories? I've been to the Taylor factory twice. Um, LSL Guitars, I've been there. In That's in Van Nuys. It's real close to here. Um, LSL Guitars are very well-built guitars. They're a little bit pricey. Kind of, they're kind of boutique-y. He makes like tellies and straps mainly. They're kind of boutique-y. <laughs> it's full of guitars, yeah. <laughs> you might watch that, right? It'll be interesting to see. Like I'm, a, I'm live so often. You're very likely to see an earthquake. You know, if an earthquake happens, it, it's, it's, you know, there's a good, what is it? You know, four percent chance that you'll see it live. But um, the, uh, um, the other thing I thought, well, you know, is if I'm live all the time, if I have a stroke or something, you guys will be, the, you'll know before me, and so you guys can call nine one one for me. So I figured, well, that's another advantage to being live all the time. All right. Um, hey, Steve Barry, thanks for the, uh, fa thanks for the love there on PayPal. Uh, appreciate that hundred percent. Really, really do. Um, and, uh, I won't say how much he gave me, but I, I don't, I'm retiring next week. <laughs> We're moving to Tahiti. Thanks to Steve Barry. <laughs> okay. Now Steve, now Steve thinks I'm being sarcastic and that like, well, that wasn't very much. <laughs> it's like, no, Steve, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm sorry. I want to give that impression. You all know my heart. You know that I'm not that kind of person. Okay. Uh, let's see. Emerald's Factory. Uh, Emerald. Oh, is Emerald Guitars. Oh, yeah. Do it, man. Once the once you can travel again, once the COVID thing's over, you know, um, we'll see what happens. You know, if I have to get a vaccine, I will for traveling. But I don't, I don't feel like for a virus that's 99% survival, I'm not particularly interested in being experimented on. <laughs> so, but everyone I know has it. Um, let's see. Oh, Nigel Tufnell, the sustain. Listen to it, Mark. <laughs> I don't hear anything. Well, you would though, if it were playing. I know. Such a great movie. Oh my gosh. That's one of the best scenes too. Why not make 10 more louder and just make it 10? No, mine goes to 11. That's one more in it. <laughs> so many good lines from, from that. Let's see. Oh, thank, thanks, Steve. Yeah, that's awesome. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm all the way live. Yeah, about as live as you can get. Uh, yes, if you haven't seen This Is Spinal Tap, it was a movie in 1984, I believe. Uh, it was A lot of people saw it. In fact, I was watching some interviews recently, and a lot of people thought it was a real band. Um, and they were like, oh, my gosh, this band is you know, horrible. What's happened to this band? And all this. And it's like, so they did phenomenally good job of creating a history. That was really brilliant. And then the other thing was, um, uh, was uh, uh, Mighty Wind, same thing. You know, they all those album covers and, oh gosh, it's just so brilliant. Um, I got, I, I, I've met, uh, let's see, um, the bass player, what's his name? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Shoot. Harry Shearer. Um, I actually played um, guitar for Harry Shearer's Christmas party a couple of years ago. I was I was subbing for um, <laughs> Steve Lukather, one of my idols, and so that was pretty fun. Um, and it was just a bunch of Christmas songs, and well, it was a bunch of different artists getting up and singing songs. So there were a lot of people there doing stuff, and um, and Harry uh, and Judy, is his wife, and um, Lee Sklar played bass. So I got to play next, sitting next to Lee Sklar all day, and that was a lot of fun. Um, I don't remember it paid anything. I, I probably did, but I, you know, not enough. And, and it, I didn't need to get paid because it was kind of getting to hang with a bunch of people that, you know, I, it was a lot of fun people. Um, I got to meet Peter Asher and talk to him quite a bit. Um, and Peter Asher, um, if you don't know, is Jane Asher, the actress's brother. And Peter was uh, uh, in a group called Peter Gordon. It was just post Beatlemania. Well, not post Beatlemania. Right around the time of Beatlemania, uh, but he also was a big record producer. So he produced, um, I believe, he produced a lot of James Taylor and Linda Ronstadt records. So uh, big records. Oh, that's right. L yeah, you're right, Michael. LSL names their some of their instruments after LA neighborhoods. I forgot about that. You're right. Um, 
You've been, wow, you've been, Gary, you've been to a lot, uh, Central, oh. Oh, breweries, oh, breweries, oh, we're talking about breweries now. <laughs> did I say breweries or did I say guitar manufacturers? <laughs> so anyway, um... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I you know, it's not a political thing for me. It's just, I mean, I, uh, I you know, I don't want to get in trouble with YouTube here and talking about the COVID vaccine and have to take my channel. Uh, but I'm, uh, aren't you? Like I, you know, <laughs> I saw some some video on TikTok that said you know it was like it was like a fake ad. If you back in nineteen or in twenty twenty one, if you got the COVID vaccine, call the law offices of so and so, you know, right? And it's like, yeah, I mean, that's kind of one of those things where I'm like, yeah, you know, I was like, if you got the anthrax vaccine, uh, you know, call this number, and um, you know, I'm afraid of that, you know, I'm like, uh, what what are the what are the long term things? And um, the ironic thing about that is though, I don't think you could call a lawyer. I don't think because somebody. Somebody said this yesterday. I was like, oh, they got, oh, yeah, I got the vaccine. Well, you know, if, it, if something happens, I'll just sue the company. It's like, I don't think you can because we, you know, they have the, usually with a drug, they have a, an approval process and then they do the trials. And the trials, when you take do a trial, you're getting paid for the trials um, oftentimes, if not always. I don't know. They may have to pay you something. Uh, they may have money may have to change hands so that you are forced to sign a document saying that you will not sue them. And I don't know. Uh, I'm sure many of you had the vaccine. Have you had to sign anything to say, you know, any paperwork at all? Did you have to sign anything? Because if you, because did you read the paperwork and did it say you, you, uh, because I think it's, it's what was a stage three of the process or something like that, which is usually is, you know, because they fast tracked it because they didn't want the whole world to die of COVID. And I get that. Um, and I own a lot of stock in, in, um, not a lot. I own some stock in pharmaceutical companies and I'm sympathetic to their cause. I've said this before. Uh, if I write a song, uh, that copyright is mine until 75 years after I die. So my great grandkids will probably be making money off of my music. Um, but a pharmaceutical company, uh, they only get a patent only lasts 17 years and it starts the day they apply for FDA approval. And FDA approval typically, on average, takes about 10 years. So that means they only have seven years to make back their R&D money. That's why new drugs are so expensive. It's because I was talking to someone from the pharmaceutical company, uh, a company um, and and I'm not a big fan of the pharmaceutical companies. Don't get me wrong, Big Pharma. You know, I'm not a fan of, of them giving doctors vacations and crap like that so that they'll prescribe their drugs. We are way over-prescribed for stuff. Um, way over-prescribed. And we never... Put our boys on, you know, anti-excitement drugs, <laughs> like so many parents did. I can't handle this kid. Oh, drug him, you know. Uh, I got him when I was a kid. I got some of that stuff because I was very, I, I struggled with depression when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. So I was put on antidepressants. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I'm still paying the price, I'm sure. I don't even know w what mental facilities I might have or might not have <laughs> if we, I can see through walls. That's handy. Um, but um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty sure. Let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and also the other thing, I, I'm pretty sure that if the COVID, the COVID vaccine does not work, if you don't post on social media that you got it, right? <laughs> it's like, I don't care. I really don't want to know that you got a shot in the arm. Uh, but it's pretty funny because everybody seems to want to post that. I'm like, uh, I don't care. Uh, let's see. But I'm not as worried about me getting it as my kids, you know, because again, one of the things they really don't test for, they didn't, is, is for fertility issues. But that's true of almost any drug because that, those kind of things um, don't show up for you know, 20, 30 years. If you give it to a 10 year old, you may not know that they can't have children until they're in their forties and they're just not able to. So, um, no paperwork. Interesting Tal. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Uh, that's interesting. 
Huh. So that means, yeah, and I didn't, I didn't know if there was paperwork or not. But I would assume you, you know, I assumed you had to sign something just to, to, um, although my friend of mine was at the dentist, or no, his mom was at the dentist and she wasn't going to get the vaccine. And then the dentist said, Hey, do you want the vaccine? <laughs> and she said, okay. And he gave it to her. <laughs> I'm like, the dentist had it. That's pretty funny. But dentists give shots all the time. So they're, they're used to doing that. Oh, it's not like it. Yes. Yeah, Gary, no, but that's not, I don't think that's right wing. I, I do think that I, 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 oh, now I, I am going to hear, I'm not getting political necessarily. I'm just getting societal. You know, a lot of people thought Lord of the Rings was um, written about Hitler and it wasn't. And, 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 it, and even see, or even um, Tolkien did, said it wasn't allegory. So it's not allegorical Christian literature. He, in fact, he himself said he hated allegory. Um, but I, you know, and I would make an argument that pretty much every story, every movie, everything is pretty much allegory. Uh, it all points to the, to, to God somehow, way or shape or form, you know, whether it highlights the evil that exists in the world or highlights the good that exists in the world, it all points to, to God's existence in my opinion. Um, but, and that's, that's unintentional. Most 99% of the time it's completely unintentional, but it's built into who our DNA as humans and we just tend to like the good stories and we and we tend to you know we also are attracted to the darkness too and that's part of the part of the human journey but um no tolkien's lord of the rings was actually an anti-industrialization uh diatribe essentially um he you know he glorifies the the um, agrarian society in the hobbits and he basically attacks the industrial society in uh, through um, mortar and all that. So, um, and his thing was, he said that uh, the industrial industrial age separated men or boys from their father or men from their sons, um, and uh, and that's super very true. Prior to the industrial age, you know, I always said my family, I always felt like we. Uh, when our kids were growing up, we kind of lived in a pre-industrial age world. I walked everywhere. Um, I barely ever used my car, um, except when I was driving to gigs and sessions where I had to bring a bunch of guitars. You know, I can't walk, can't walk to Malibu from Pasadena with eight guitars and three amps. You know, but um, uh, but I apprenticed my son in in the family business. Uh, we homeschooled. Uh, you know, we didn't grow our, our own food, but 200 years ago, you know, you would have been a kid, you would have been pretty much working in the fields and your job, everybody's job every day was just to get food on the table. And that was your job. Kind of the same thing, but we're letting other people do the food and we're doing other jobs. But the industrial age kind of created this, this whole new reality. And, um, and I do feel like same kind of thing happened, you know, when you start you know, uh, if one parent is basically doing most of the heavy lifting with the family stuff, it's just too much for some. And, and that's where, you know, then drug companies come along and say, oh, is this too much work? Well, here, do this, you know, use this. And, and so, uh, you know, I, get, I understand the temptation because it's, it's like, wow, you know, it's not natural. That's why I like walking so much. I really feel like walking is really centers me to the pace of how life that's the speed of life getting in a car you know <laughs> i never get mad when i'm at walking never never i mean i might get a little exasperated when somebody's like you know tries to hit me <laughs> but that really never happens but when you're in your car it's like all of a sudden you're like <sighs> Gosh, what an idiot. Oh my gosh. You know, my wife is the sweetest lady. She she turns it, I'm like, who are you when she's driving? Um, so uh yeah, it was it was well, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, he definitely disdained the the Tolkien disdained war. Who doesn't? Right? I mean, seriously. Uh, I don't know anyone who's like, oh yeah, war, let's do it. You know, it's like, no, I mean a video game, sure, but in real life. Uh, yeah, so yeah, you're right. It's industrialization and the destruction of the earth. Yeah, he, yeah, no, exactly right. Um, 
I think the earth can bounce back from pretty much anything. I was use the example of weeds growing up through concrete sidewalks. I'm like going, yeah, we try, but it's just like, if you didn't fix that, eventually it would be all weeds and no sidewalk. So, um, Oh, Antwerp. I bet that was amazing. Walking everywhere. Yeah. And see, walking for me is the pace of life. Um, you know, and, and flying is like, what, 10 times faster than driving. Um, and, and you're like, well, I'm, I'm pretty relaxed when I fly. But are we? Because, I, I, you know, the funny thing is I, I love what CJ, uh, CK, uh, Louis CK said, you know, about, the, you know, kids, you know, or is he sitting next to someone where they like, get on a plane and the, the flight attendant they, over the PA says, hey, we have Wi-Fi and you can log in here. It's free Wi-Fi and you can check your email, blah, blah, blah. And, do, and then 10 minutes later, the Wi-Fi goes down and, and the guy next to him is like, God, I can't believe this. This is this is bogus. And it's like, how entitled do you have to be to be so upset about something that you don't have now that you didn't have your entire life until 10 minutes ago? And now it's taken away from you. It's like, uh, you know, you're in a in a chair in the sky. You should be screaming, you woo, you know, but it, even flying is such a big pain in the butt now. Uh, you know, I don't know that it was ever... I mean, it's fun, always fun. I love traveling, but flying, you know, it's just that something stressful about getting up there and being in a plane, you know, locked in this tube for eight, 10, 12 hours to go to Europe or whatever. Keep in mind, I'm on the West Coast, so it takes a long time to get to London. Um, exactly, Joe, <laughs> Joseph. Um, uh, oh, Cimmerillion. I was, we were talking about this last night. Um, uh, and, um, I have not, uh, but my, my friend Steve last night, we were talking about it at dinner time and he was telling me about how James Franco and, uh, Stephen Colbert have a little <laughs> rivalry where they try to, uh, out uh, Tolkien each other. It's pretty funny. I'd never seen it before. And we pulled it up on YouTube and it was like, oh my gosh, Stephen Colbert knows like the similar Cimmerillion, like really well. He knows Tolkien insanely well. I, to be honest, I'm going to be hundred percent honest here. I think I've read two pages of the Cimmerillion and the first two pages were amazing. I mean, literally it, the first page, the second paragraph or whatever talks about the creation story. And, um, how the it's cool because as a musician, I think it's really cool and not beyond you know possibility. Although Tolkien was talking about a, a fantasy world, and that's the beauty of writing. That's why I like to write because you're creating histories, you're creating futures, you're creating worlds, whatever you know. It's it's your God essentially, you know. And I'm, I'm with a small G. Um, and but it talks about in the Cimmerillion, in the first page, it was talks about how like uh, the creator gave the choirs the ability to sing into creation, the whatever. So the things came into creation through, through music. I'm like, Oh, that's so cool. Right. I mean, you can make, you could literally make an entire movie just from the first page of the Cimmerillion. And that's why it was really hard to, for me to continue in it. Cause it was like, Oh my gosh, the names. And I'm really bad at like, wait a minute, who is this again? You know, I almost need to have a, a, a roadmap on the side to, count. oh, yeah, that person. And I have done that in the past where I'm reading some complex novel or whatever, and I'm like, and generally, generally, um, and this is true, and I'm learning this about screenplays um, too, but generally, if a character is brought into the book, they're there for a purpose, and you're going to see them again, unless there's something like this to Butler or something. But... Um, well, of course, the butler usually commits all the murders, so that's usually important, too. Um, but the Cimmerillion didn't feel that way. You know, just the first two pages of like, do I need to know these people? Because it was a very much a history of Middle Earth, I think, is what... Because uh, Cimmerillion predates Lord of the Rings, which Lord of the Rings I've read at least twice, Hobbit at least twice. Um, and, uh, in fact, I just got given a big rack for hard for computers uh that i may need for my this upcoming project and it's like this giant rack it's 
air cool, you know, the cooling rack for PCs. And um, the friend that gave it to me, he just, he just gave it to me. He said, uh, he said, oh yeah, this, this thing was in Peter Jackson's office for like six months while I worked on, uh, uh, he was working on Cirque du Soleil stuff, you know, writing, scoring the music, uh, music, for a movie about Cirque du Soleil in, in, um, uh, in fact, we talked about, um, what's, uh, Auckland, New Zealand. And, um, he's like, yeah, you know, we got to go there. And <laughs> like, we do. He goes, yeah, yeah, I'll get a project. We'll just bring you down to it or something. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I'm the, I'm game, but yeah, he, it was pretty cool. So, you know, I don't know if I'm going to need all of that, but he gave it to me just in case I do. And I'm like, great. So, um, Let's see. Oh, are we having a, a theological discussion? Oh, the Men in Black movie when the aliens played with the marbles. Yeah, in the big picture of things, planets could be part of atoms. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I didn't think about that too. In fact, that's part of the reason why I believe in God because I my brain couldn't, as a kid, couldn't comprehend nothing. Like, I, I would ask my, what's beyond the universe? You know, the known universe. Well, nothing. It can't be nothing. <laughs> can't nothing is something. It's like I couldn't, you know. Well, it's expanding. I'm like into what? <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it's like, ah. But dimensional, not you know, thinking is is for all intents and purposes a, a, a construct uh, of ours, if not God's. But um, so you know, <laughs> there's always. Was was it was it, was it uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is so good, the BBC thing, you know, like you get, was it like, what they do they reference like the eleventh dimension or, you know, you know, it's it's funny like, well, the fourth dimension is this, and then time, and then the fifth dimension is this, and then the sixth dimension, seventh, seventh dimension is where, you know, everyone looks like, you know, uh, uh, you know, John Quincy Adams or something, you know, some crazy thing like that. So, uh, what else have we got? We were talking all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, the fun thing was when Beth and I got married, you know, and I, I, I couldn't, you couldn't do this today <laughs> with, with kids. Cause it was like, we didn't have a TV. Uh, we didn't have any money. We had nothing. We were, <laughs> we had enough to pay our rent that month and we're like, Oh no, what are we going to do next month? Well, we, you know, we always, we were always up on our bills. We never got behind on our bills, but it was scary. There were a couple of months where we had $30, $40 left in the checking account. We're like, oh gosh. Um, and uh, we didn't have a TV for the first six months. And somebody finally felt bad for us and gave us a little black and white TV, you know, which we didn't really watch that much. But we got, we just never, had, and we still don't have a TV in our bedroom. I would never put a TV in the bedroom. We have one TV, that's it. But TV is irrelevant today because there are kids that don't even have TVs. They don't have cable. They, don't, they got their iPad or they got their phone or they got their laptop. They don't need a TV. They can watch everything they're going to watch on those devices. So, but I, I would, when we first got married, you know, 20 years ago, I would, you know, 30 plus years ago, but 20 years ago, I would tell young couples, hey, if you don't need a TV in the house, don't have a TV. And I, we read, I read Lord of the Rings to Beth in bed every night. We got through the whole thing because I read, including the Council of Elrond, which both of us were like, God, why am I doing this? <laughs> this is just a brutal. Um, quantum physics, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was, well, we didn't have kids then. So, yeah, it was, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty bad. I, needless to say, I didn't have to pay a lot of taxes in those years. Um, but we never took any welfare or anything like that. We, you know, we qualified for stuff. We didn't take advantage. We just, we just figured we'd do better next month. And we did every year has been generally better than the previous. In fact, when the, the, con the, uh, collapse of 2009 hit, that was when my career started taking off. And I felt bad because, um, Everybody else, everybody was having a hard time, but I was not. And so I just was kind of shutting up about it. <laughs> it's like. The Narnia books. Yes, they're good, too. You know, uh, Gary, have you read the Space Trilogy? And they've talked about making a movie about it. Well, that's another thing we were <laughs> talking about last night. 
was uh, the the step uh, who who controls all the C.S. Lewis catalog is the his stepson, and uh, apparently he's not the easiest person to deal with. So um, I think there's probably no plans to make the trilogy just because I think Disney owns the rights to it though. In fact, they own the, Disney owns the rights to Narnia, and they've thought about doing a TV series. Um, I think at some point, but maybe there maybe that's already out there. I know that Amazon's doing a Lord of the Rings TV series. Did you know that? And they literally uh, are spent. It's going to be the first billion dollar TV series, and they're filming it in New Zealand. Um, but uh, it, my understanding is, it all predates Lord of the Rings, so it's all pre that. And I haven't read Gary. I haven't read the Space Trilogy in a long time. I read it and and remember just going, "Whoa, this is crazy." And then, like ten years later, we were talking about. It, I said, "Hey, they should make the Space Trilogy." And somebody said, "And this may have been a little before CGI was so effect, you know, so good." They said, "I don't think you can actually do a film about the Space Trilogy. It might not be able to be done." Yeah, the Chronicles of Narnia is fun, and aren't they? Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's just a really good, and it's hundred percent allegory. <laughs> C.S. Lewis was was not, yeah, was not, didn't have a problem with allegory, uh, like Tolkien did. But uh, yeah, Tolkien, <laughs> Tolkien apparently hated allegory. I wonder how that went because they were, I know they were friends. I'm sure Tolkien was like, yeah, your nautical stuff is garbage or whatever. I don't know. I think Tolkien, The Hobbit was originally wasn't it originally written as a just basically as a story for his son to read because his son was living in South Africa, I think. And uh, it was, he was like a soldier or something. He was stationed in South Africa. Um, oh, go take care, Tal. Good to see you. Sorry I couldn't play that song for you. It's been too long since I've played. I could, it's a, it's a great song, a classical gas. You should learn it. Do you play it? Then you can listen to it anytime you want to. Surprised by joy. Yeah, C.S. Lewis, that, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I really like the great divorce. Well, I, I love uh, Mere Christianity. Um, also, um, yeah, John, 100%. John, it sounds, it sounds like you and your, uh, yeah, we, we're good stewards of what Lord gave. Yeah, no, no, I, we, ne I, I don't think, other than, mortgage interest and interest on a car loan um, I've ever paid interest I always paid off our credit cards every month I didn't buy anything that I didn't have money to pay for um, and you know I always felt like you remember when, when, when we first got married 1987 interest rates were like 10 percent so if you just had a thousand dollars in a money market fund you'd be making a hundred dollars a year um, and so I would I had a money market checking account and I um we would, I would basically think, well, why not? You know, if I used a credit card because I wanted to use someone else's money for 55 days. So if I bought something on March 5th and the bill wasn't due until uh, June 1st, I was essentially using their money for 55 days so that instead of paying cash for something uh, today, um, and if it was say it was a thousand dollars, you know, you figure 10 percent annual interest. Those two months is that's you know that's going to make me twelve thirteen fifteen dollars in in interest um, to not pay that now so you know so I kind of used all the math I could use to figure out the best way to save um, and uh, and then always was investing in, you know part of our down payment for our house was you know McDonald's I sold a McDonald's stock and a Walmart stock and in, Intel I had a lot of Intel Walmart and McDonald's. And that was a big chunk of our down payment. Now, I had to pay cap gains when I sold it, which was a bummer. I knew that was going to happen. You factor that in. But it was like, oh, it hurts so much. But I had been reinvesting the dividends all that time, and I didn't have to pay cap gains on the dividends because I paid those tax on those when they were distributed. So 12%, yes. My first car loan was 20%. And that was through a bank. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? Uh, it was awful. I paid twenty thousand dollars for a ten thousand dollar car on a five year loan. Unbelievable. Uh, yeah, I think our current loan is three. What are we at? Three six five or three two five? I forget. It's pretty. It's like insanely low. 
two point seven. Isn't that insane? Now, of course, you're not getting any money on your um, on your account, your your uh, checking accounts, and all that. Yeah, I'll pay you Tuesday for hamburger today, exactly, and I'll earn interest on that money in the meantime. Um, but yeah, we definitely lived below our means. We drove old cars, and then um, at one point. Um, Beth was teaching, and I was te doing clinics, teaching clinics and playing, uh, leading worship at a church, but I was doing it interim, but I was interim for two and a half years. And we decided to, because um, Emma was getting, you know, the, I was homeschooling the boys, and Emma was getting a little older, and we decided to have Beth stay home. And we were managing the building, so we had free rent which was great. So we didn't have that big monthly bill. Our biggest bill, I think, was probably health insurance. Well, actually, at the time, we weren't paying health insurance because Beth had, was a school teacher. So she quits her job. Uh, the clinics that I was teaching, making decent money doing, they stopped doing those. And the church hired a worship leader. So basically, in the same six-month period, we lost about 80% of our income in about a six month period. And without knowing any of this, Beth's parents did a kind of a, they've got, between the two of them, they have nine kids and uh, Beth's mom and stepdad. And they did kind of a distribution to all the kids and spouses, all the kids, all nine were married, all nine kids. So they get, you know, they, everybody, they, they, oh, I know what happened. They sold the mill. And so they gave a, a lump sum to all the kids. And it was a pretty decent amount of money. And I put it in a, in, I invested some of it and put it in the checking account. And I think, oh, I also sent Beth to Paris with her sister. That's what I did. Um, Cause she'd never been to Europe and I wanted her, I'd never been to Europe and I wanted her to you know, see Paris and before she was 40. And uh, so she went, but, but that money, I mean, we lost 80% of our income. It would have been like right around 2000. Um, 2000, 2000, it was 2000 and, um, it was just an act of faith. I just, just kept doing my job. I kept doing things and I got, that's when I started working at Shepherd Church. Um, and my work really started, started to get more session work. I, I hustled more students. It just, we never touched that money that her parents gave us, never touched it. And uh, we just, it just kept showing up and we just, you know, we were living below our means. I mean, we live way below our means. Uh, it's pretty funny. I mean, it's like, we just, you know, we, but we were content. Uh, I've told you that, you know, uh, there is the, believe it or not, there's something called spiritual gifts, you know, and there is a spiritual gift of poverty. And you're like, I don't want that. And that, it's not really what that means, but monks have it, you know, people, you know, people that have, uh, you know, uh, you know, they have nothing. They're content. And that's what it is. You're, I think we were blessed with uh, the gift, the spiritual gift of poverty. In other words, contentedness, which I would want everyone to have. Um, and, and if you have contentedness with what you've got, and we've talked about this, because remember I told you to pray for those who have something you want and pray that they get more. And it, and you're like, well, no, no, I want, I want what they have, or I want them to get less or no, 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 no. Envy will drive you to do horrible things. Jealousy will make you make bad decisions, and it'll make you miserable. And immediately, if you pray for somebody that has something that you want or wish you had, that they will get more uh, and be blessed and have a blessed life, immediately that envy goes away and you, contentedness comes right back and you're fine. You know, and I think, you know, it's it's... It's easy to have maybe content in this when it's just the two of you. But when you start having kids and then they got to go to college and they need cars and it, it, it's tough. You, you know, you do have to work really hard. It's, it's you, you all, Most of you I know have been there. And so, you know, it's like I hate owning cars. And at one point I own five cars and I'm like, I don't want to own five cars. I'm really close to the point of just getting rid of my car because I hardly ever drive it. I'm like, if I need to go somewhere, I'll just Uber. <laughs> so, it'd probably be cheaper ultimately. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, um, oh yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah, that's right. Joseph, um, uh, C.S. Lewis, it was a lot. Of, I agree. Never do. Now 
I, I'm not going to be a ballet dancer <laughs> or a professional tennis player. <laughs> not going to happen, either one of those. But I could get better at tennis or play tennis and have fun doing it. I have fun playing guitar, you know. So... Um, there's an adult chord. Here, I'll give you a... You want to... There's an adult chord right there. <laughs> okay, I'm going to write this out. That's an E4 chord. Let me know if you can do this. So here it is. It's 076200. It's E4. A4 is a little easier. It's just mostly us here. It's gotten down to 23 people. I should probably take off. It's been a couple hours, almost a couple hours. I was late. Now, uh, Wednesday, I'm going to try to have, I mean, today I was talking about, really what I was talking about today was infinite possibilities with strumming grooves. I'll try to be a little bit more specific with some strumming grooves. Maybe we'll take a kind of a break from the, the pick grooves, and maybe I'll, I'll find some simple Brazilian thing we can do on Wednesday or something. Um, but... Uh, um, because that would be for me as much as you. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but remember, my hand is, my left hand is bigger than my right hand. Because because look how much wider I can spread my left hand than my right hand. That's crazy, isn't it? Look at that. It's like a, more than an inch. Um, <clears throat> you can make the stretch, Bob. Wow. Very nice. Joseph, you, yeah, you start playing at 66. Yep. Well, so many of my, I mean, read the comments on my, you know, uh, um, it's pretty encouraging in some ways. And there's, the thing that really makes me happy is all the cheerleading that goes on on that on my uh, seven tips for older beginners. If you haven't watched that video since you, you first discovered me, um, just you don't need to watch the video again, but you could look up the, you could check out the uh, the comments. And then the comments to the comments, which are really the, the sweetheart thing, because uh, people are like I'm, I'm. I really want to do this. I want to do this my whole life. I never took up guitar. All my brother took up whatever, and uh, uh, and there are people like you got this. You can do this. Check out this or whatever. You know, oh, I'm, we're with you. I'm right there with you. You know that kind of stuff. It's really fun to read. So, um, and I have those set not to approval because there's so many comments. I just let them approve. So I don't know what people are saying. Hopefully they're not being snarky. But <laughs> yeah, you can watch later. Um, Let's see. And so, yeah, I will maybe I have a more specific lesson on Wednesday. I just was like literally from Friday, we stopped Friday to, to now. I've been almost nonstop as far as just like working or uh, entertaining. Um, and so and I got a lot of work coming up. So I've, I've said that I'm probably going to pull back to two a week or one a week. Um, it's at some point. Um, and uh, um uh, and I appreciate all of you are, who have been saying, yeah, that's totally, we totally understand. In fact, you guys will have more of a life now. You'll be like, what am I going to do with this two hours of my Wednesday? <laughs> so uh, just do it. Exactly right. Chip away, you know, a little bit at a time. And that's kind of what my, that's, I think why my seven tips is so popular because it is encouraging. And it is also like, look, you, you know, and I know as an adult, you know, I, I know I'm probably not going to get to the gym every day. Um, and that kind of thing. And so, but if I had, you know, if I go, oh, I, you know, I can, I can do a hundred pushups a day, no problem. Or I can do, um, a hundred sit-ups every day, you know, groups of 20 or whatever. Um, it's not like I have to get in the car, get, get the gym gear on, get in the car, drive to the gym, log in, park, log in, go to do all the workout, leave, come home, take a shower or whatever. You know, that's an hour and a half at least. I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, so, uh, that's kind of, that's kind of what I was, that was my starting point for the whole seven tips video was that, look, yeah, you just got to kind of trick yourself into playing. Maybe have like, I have like, have a guitar hanging up, just one guitar, you know, like me, you know, <laughs> it'll guilt you. It'll be your Jewish mother that guilts you into eating your food or marrying that girl or whatever. Uh, let's see. And I think Bruce will be back. Uh, I think Bruce is back on Wednesday. Um, and then, uh, if not Wednesday, then Friday, I forget, I forget. He told, he told me, but, uh, I'm trying to remember now. So, 
uh, a Bolero beat. Yeah, or or I could show you the rumba thing. Um, I just want to be careful with the rumba thing. I don't want you to. I don't want you to. <laughs> I don't want you to email me and say, "Hey Tom, I uh, my the the uh, my top collapsed on my acoustic because I hit it so hard." Um, and uh, but I I can show you the rumba thing. You can start practicing that. It's a pretty fun. Um, let me do it on the nylon because it's much more fun. You're welcome, Holly. It's a pretty violent strumming pattern. Uh, you know, you can even hear over here. But I hit, I, I, generally, I think they hit right on the bridge so that they can bring their fingers up. See? There's your. One and two and three, uh, three and four and one and two and three and three. See, I just caught my thumb. And so this is the kick, snare, kick, snare. So it's one, two. You can even practice that. And th this is like, you hear that? It's really low because you're hitting the bout of the guitar. You're hitting the big part of the guitar. And then here, really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to push the, the, the strings onto the fret so they make it that snapping sound. You can do that from back here, you can do it here, you can even hit there and it's gonna make a brighter, dark, deep, bright, low, bright, low, like that. So anyway. Uh, we'll talk about that. Maybe that's the one we'll do the rumba. Um, I don't know the bolero. I'm trying, I'll have to think about a bolero beat, but that may be one of the beats that's in. I, I have a book of things like that, so I may that may be in there. But this would be a departure from the pick thing. And so I don't know if you want to do that on a steel string guitar because I think if you drag your nails over that, you're going to shred your nails. <laughs> so I'm real. You know, I did it on there on the on the Martin, but it's like it feels real weird. It's like. Those, you know, those strings become razor blades when your hands are moving that fast. So, but the nylon strings, it's kind of easy. So if you have a nylon string guitar, make it, get it handy just in case I, I go there. I'm not sure what I'm going to teach, but anyway, I got to go do some push-ups, right? You know, the ladies like the triceps, by the way, right? Am I right, Holly? So the, the reverse push-ups, like on the edge of a chair or something, those are great for the tricep buildup. So if you want the ladies to like, check out your arms, get the triceps going on. <laughs> yeah, Lena, we'll do it slow when I do it. Don't worry. <laughs> you can watch this video back later and put it on slow speed, but uh, I'll talk you through it. We'll get to it. Oh, yeah, see, Barry, those are great. Uh, yeah, that was the very first series, The Cage, I think, was the first series. Um, and I had no idea I'd still be doing it today. <laughs> if I'd known I was, I never would have started. <laughs> if I'd known it was going to be 200 lessons <laughs> in a year. I never would have started lesson one. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I would have. Anyway, well, God bless you all. Thank you all for watching. And uh, hopefully you got something out of this lesson. My, the main goal here, the main, the book ends here. Uh, again, I didn't know what I was going to teach today because I just kind of woke up and like, okay, I got to get, I got to log in. Um, but the main thing is learn to listen to the drummer. Um, listen to records, listen to, you know, the radio, listen to TV co commercials even. What is the hi-hat doing? What is the snare doing? What is the kick? Learn to separate those instruments, okay? That's a really key thing about being a musician because then, you know, you're going to want to lock to what the, the hi-hat's doing a lot of times and the kick and things like that. So, and what I did was I took that groove and I turned it into the drum pattern, the boom, 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 boom. I, turn, I turned that into a strumming groove. And I'm like, cool, I can use this groove. Um, so that's exactly... Uh, what we're trying to do. Anyway, okay, I'm going to stop streaming now. God bless you guys. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.